Amy is our county agent in Passaic and Essex counties. And um, Amy has her PhD in stormwater management engineering. And uh, she and her husband also have a small poultry farm in um, Warren County. So her topic tonight, uh, very pertinent, uh, stormwater management and climate risks. So welcome, Amy. Yeah, well, thank you, Madeline. Thank you, everybody. It's good to be here. Uh, yeah, so, so we're going to go over some very basic basic basics of stormwater management and climate risks and some practices that you can undertake on your farm to, to help mitigate those risks. Obviously, we can't predict the future, but we have uh, some, some ideas of where things are trending. So let's just dive right in here. So I just want to give some background on stormwater itself. Uh, so let's just start at the at the beginning. So when it rains, so when we have precipitation, there are several things that, that can happen. So the, the water can be uptaken by plants, uh, which use that water for all of their important biological processes. The water can infiltrate down into the soil, all the way down to groundwater. That water can also evaporate. Uh, it can go back up into the atmosphere or it can run off. So let's talk about runoff. So stormwater runoff or stormwater or runoff, as it can be called any of those terms, is what happens when, when the precipitation hits an impervious surface. So an impervious surface is anything that is not allowing water to move through it. So something hard like asphalt, concrete, rooftops, uh, even a field with grass on it can be considered an impervious surface if it is compacted and not allowing water to go through. Obviously, um, on, on your farm, you want to have pervious surfaces that are allowing water to flow through and to have that infiltration down into the soil for, for all of your plants. So just to give you an idea of the differences in terms of runoff between a natural environment and an urban environment, uh, on the left you can see how there is really not that much runoff in natural conditions. So we have a lot of shallow infiltration at the, at the surface of the, of the soil and where plants would be having their root zones. And then you also have very deep infiltration. And then you also have water evapotranspiring back into the atmosphere at a high percentage. But in an urban environment or developed even, again, even on agricultural settings, you can have a lot of, a lot of runoff generated by all of these hard surfaces. So, um, so in our cities and any place that has has parking lots, roadways, rooftops, all of those things are generating runoff at very high percentages compared to natural conditions. So we we want to promote infiltration and we want to, to have runoff not even being generated. We want to reduce runoff at the source and we'll, we'll talk about that more later. But there's another problem with stormwater uh, that is called non-point source pollution. So all of the hard surfaces that are sitting there while it's not raining are collecting contaminants every day. There is atmospheric deposition that falls onto all of these surfaces. There are spills, there's debris, there's litter, anything that that society is putting out on, on all of these hard surfaces is collected by rainfall on its way to, to a receiving water body. So this non-point source pollution is leading to contaminated waterways. And this is, this is society pollution. It's not traced to any single polluter. And here on the left is an example of uh, runoff coming off of a, an agricultural field that is probably collecting fertilizer or pesticides on its way down to the receiving stream. So non-point source pollution is regulated by by NJDEP, the uh, Department of Environmental Protection. But then we also have point source pollution, and this is something that you may be more familiar with. This is where pollutants are coming from a very specific source. So something like a 
a spill, a discharge directly into a river or stream. Uh, so point source pollution does have a quote unquote smoking gun. So this is usually industry, factory, treatment plants, and this is also regulated by, by the DEP. Uh, but why is this a problem? So non-point source pollution collecting all of those contaminants on their way to our receiving water bodies. Uh, this is impacting water quality across the state. This is impacting recreation. This is impacting fish and wildlife, all of these things. And so here are some examples of all of the contaminants that can be collected uh, through runoff leading to, to our local waterways. So you can see all of the things um, that we need to be worried about and need to reduce uh, runoff so that we don't have all of these contaminants going into, going into our water bodies. So another problem with all of our impervious surfaces is that they are often connected. Uh, so you have a building with the downspout heading out to, to an impervious roadway down into the sewer system. And then all of these connected impervious services don't allow for, for groundwater recharge. They don't allow for the recharge of stream-based flow during dry conditions. There's no chance for, for plants to uptake any of that water or for infiltration through the soil for improved water quality. Uh, and then this also leads to very high flow rates as that water moves through, through the environment. So it gets to the receiving water body and can lead to scour, erosion. Uh, the peak flow rates and volumes are often very, very high and that stream or river cannot handle all of that water coming so quickly. And so, so stormwater runoff is not just a water quantity issue, but it's also a water quality issue. And so these, these are reasons why we need to, to manage stormwater, especially on our agricultural um, properties and agricultural practices. And this is even more of, of a concern with our climate change. Um, so we have no real, um, you know, we can't we can't predict the future, but certainty certainly our we're seeing um, new weather patterns. We are seeing extreme weather events, and we are seeing all kinds of things that lead us to having to be more adaptable in the future with regard to with regard to weather. And so, so this this climate change is is it's coming, it's happening. I'm sure you have noticed uh, just in this quote unquote winter that we've had, we are not really getting the cold temperatures that we usually get this summer. We had a fairly, um, a fairly extreme drought. Uh, we've had very heavy wet weather uh, over the past couple of years also. And so unfortunately your agricultural operation needs to prepare for all of these uh, possible uh, extreme weather scenarios. So we will get to that in a minute. So one way that you can adapt to storm water that is, it may be more extreme, it may be, um, you know, more, more often, we may have larger rain events, we may have rain more often, like I said. And so, so there is a, an approach to stormwater management called green infrastructure. So this type of uh, practice is allowing operations and society as a whole to be resilient to climate risks. So basically you are using nature and the natural hydrology on a site to capture stormwater, to filter it, to reuse it, or to make sure that water is uptaken by plants to help us reduce flooding, as well as to improve water quality. So green infrastructure takes advantage of natural systems that are much more adaptable compared to what we call gray infrastructure, like uh, concrete, uh, piping, um, you know, anything that is a built, uh, hard gray infrastructure environment. So we are looking to, to use nature and to use biology 
to manage stormwater. And this is especially helpful in, in agricultural settings so that you can uh, reuse uh, stormwater that's coming through so that you can use all that water to, to your advantage. So some benefits of green infrastructure are, are here. I'm not going to read them all, um, but basically because these systems are much more natural, they are much more adaptable. They are, uh, we are recommending to use native plants in these systems so that they are more um, adaptable to our changing climate. They're more adaptable to New Jersey's climate so they won't need as, as much tender loving care. Um, and these types of installations also have lower life cycle costs compared to uh, built gray infrastructure systems. And so this is um, one way that you can also provide habitat for, for pollinators and for, for local flora and fauna. And so all of these, all of these things are making green infrastructure uh, and advantageous over, over gray infrastructure that, that is not adaptable and is not providing uh, some of these benefits. So what are some green infrastructure design practices? So here is a list of some that you may or may not be able to use on your, on your agricultural property, um, but I just wanted to, to go through them so that you can get some ideas. Um, a lot of farms that are in operation already know how to do stormwater management, but again, because of our changing climate and having more uh, rain events or more extreme rain events, uh, you still may need to consider how, how stormwater is managed on your operation. So here's a list. I will go through them quickly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on all of these, but you have uh, all of this information on the, on the Canvas module. And so you can take a look at your leisure, but I just wanted to, to quickly run through uh, some of the ones that may be more uh, pertinent to, to a small agricultural operation. Uh, so one of the best things that you can do to manage stormwater, especially on, um, on a larger, uh, a larger operation, or, you know, something like a farm and not just a, a household, uh, is certainly disconnection. So you want to think about disconnecting stormwater systems from, from your, your buildings from all of your, your outbuildings and consider directing that runoff to somewhere useful. So not just to the already connected storm system, but putting that water somewhere that it can be useful. Um, so rather than out of sight, out of mind, uh, that water has a chance to, to infiltrate into the soil. Uh, if you are on a well system, it will certainly help recharge groundwater um, and you you will really help prevent stormwater right at the source because instead of generating stormwater that water is allowed to to go back into into the ecological system and to to have that water uh, doing something useful instead of being a, a nuisance and just generating more and more stormwater quantity. Um, so another thing that you could do is actually harvest uh, all of that stormwater and all of that rainwater. So this can be used for, for all kinds of things, especially on an agricultural um, on agricultural property. Uh, so you can certainly use it for, for livestock. You can use it to, to irrigate your landscape. This will help reduce flooding. And again, this will help reduce pollution because we are preventing stormwater right at the source. So here is just an example of how you are going to go about harvesting rainwater. Uh, so you have a building with a, uh, a downspout and a gutter and you disconnect from the, the regular storm system and you put a, a large container, uh, a cistern that can catch you know, 500 to thousands of gallons of water. And like I said, you can use that water to water your livestock, or you can use it for, for irrigation purposes, depending on, depending on certain quality um, practices that you need to follow. And so just to show you how much, how much rainfall 
or how much rainwater can you harvest just from a small rainfall event? So if you have a roof area that's 800 square feet, so an 80 foot by 10 foot, and you have a one inch rainfall event, that generates 500 gallons of water. So if we have a 44 inch rainfall each year in New Jersey, again, this is increasing a little bit, uh, but if we have 44 inches of rainfall per year, you could capture 22,000 gallons of water uh, just from just from having a cistern on some of your, your outbuildings. And so this is going to be useful um, partially because we are we are seeing more droughts. And so if we can capture water in the spring before we get to our drought in the summer, uh, then this is a great way to store and have water ready for, for irrigation and for watering livestock uh, down, down the line. So here is rainwater harvesting at a small scale on a farm. So this is a, a chicken coop that we have on our property and we are capturing Capturing rainwater here, um, you know, in a 50 gallon, 50 gallon drum, uh, we do have a rain barrel on all of our uh, chicken coops. And so we don't really need to have um, pipes or running water out into the coops. They are all mobile coops, so we're moving them every week. And so having water right there is really helpful to, to water the, the poultry. And so this is a, an example of a small scale uh, rainwater harvesting operation, but there are also uh, very large scale uh, rainwater harvesting systems that can be installed for, for agricultural uh, operations. And certainly if you have a very large barn or if you have a, a greenhouse, um, like AJ was showing earlier, uh, you may you know, certainly consider capturing all of the runoff that's coming off of that rooftop and figuring out how to how to store it and how to get it where it needs to go uh, on your farm property. So some things to consider if you are going to to have um, rainwater harvesting. So if you're going to use it for your for watering livestock, make sure that you calculate the water demand based on the kind of the kind of livestock that you that you have. Uh, certainly it is very easy to, to water some chickens in a very small chicken coop, um, but if you have uh, horses or you have cows, you're going to need a lot more water. So this rainwater harvesting may not serve all of your needs. Um, but also if you are going to be using water that's collected from all of your rooftops as uh, irrigation water, make sure you calculate your, your water demand based on which crop you are using. And then be sure to apply that water directly to the soil and not to the fruit or the leaves, uh, just because again, you are collecting rainwater from a, an impervious surface that during dry spells will collect particles and um, bacteria and all kinds of things. So um, you may you may want to want to think about how you are applying that water. And then for both uses, you really want to keep the keep the rainwater collectors covered. We don't want to breed mosquitoes uh, and it will also help reduce evaporation. And then because of the contaminants that can be up on rooftops, you may want to consider a first flush diverter uh, for rainwater harvesting at a large scale, just because the, the first flush diverter will capture, will divert the first, you know, half an inch of rain um, so that you don't have as many contaminants going into your collected rainwater um, storage system. So consider that, and I can certainly show you some, some products that would be appropriate for that. So just some things to remember uh, when you're thinking about rainwater harvesting. Uh, so another practice that is really helpful for managing stormwater is called a rain garden. Uh, Madeline is an expert on installing these and designing these, uh, but they can be used to, to capture stormwater. They will um, be aesthetically pleasing. They are promoting infiltration down into the soil. And so a rain garden is just a, a shallow bowl that is built into an environment to specifically capture stormwater 
right where you need it. Um, these systems are very flexible. They can be placed just about anywhere. They can be sized um, based on the water area that you're collecting collecting from. So usually it's a rooftop, but it can be a, a parking area, a driveway area. Um, any of those places can be the, the source water for, for your rain garden. Um, and at a larger scale, these are called bioretention basins. And I'll show you an example of that a little later. Um, but these can be very useful for preventing wet areas on your property. And just to be clear, you don't place this where you have a stormwater management issue. You place a rain garden upstream from where you're having the issue to capture that stormwater and to prevent uh, the drainage issues downstream. And so here are some examples uh, at a municipal level. And certainly they are providing habitat for, for pollinators and providing some, you know, some beauty to, to areas that, that may not necessarily have them. Uh, so here are all the all the benefits of rain gardens. I'm not going to to spend a lot of time on this, um, but I just want you to see it and please look at the the resources in the in the Canvas module. I gave uh, some fact sheets and some some information on on all of these practices over there. Um, so another green infrastructure practice that may be helpful on on your farm operation is called permeable pavement. So this is a pavement type that allows water to, to flow through and to be stored underneath or to infiltrate down into the native soil. And so this is especially helpful in areas that may be um, overflow parking uh, or areas that, you know, that you have a, a need for, for something um, structural to to park on and to to have a a spot to to drive around and have some have some hard surfaces, but they allow water to to flow through. So you're not generating runoff. You're not adding to um, you know adding to uh, stormwater right right where you are trying to to drain things. Uh, so so these uh, permeable pavements can unfortunately be very expensive, especially um, if you go with a a more um, traditional system like the, the porous asphalt or the, the porous uh, concrete, they can be expensive to install, um, but because you don't need to, to have a typical stormwater system, you don't need stormwater basins, you don't need all of the, the piping and the things that would normally go uh, around a parking area. Um, so they can offset some of those costs that way. Um, but yeah, these these systems are are fairly complicated in terms of engineering. So um, please let me know if you're interested, and I can connect you to um, to uh, experts and contractors who who are certified by by the um, by the um, what's the word uh, the technical agencies. Um, so you make sure you get someone that knows what they're doing. Um, so here is just showing you the, the surface and the storage area under a permeable pavement so that you can see um, how all of that water is handled very quickly and it eventually infiltrates down into the ground or you can capture it uh, with a pipe underneath and direct it again for, for storage, for irrigation and for other things. So it's something to consider. Uh, especially if you have a, a larger operation where you have to manage the stormwater effectively. Uh, so vegetated swales are also a great way to, to manage stormwater. Um, they can uh, really reduce peak flow. They are very good at handling stormwater and making sure that that water gets into the ground. They can be used to direct stormwater to places that you want it to go rather than uh, having all of the drainage issues where you don't want them. And so it's basically just a, a large ditch uh, along, a, along a parking area or along a roadway or along a field um, that is vegetated and has, um, has some engineering so that, again, that water is infiltrating where you want it to go and it's also um, planted so that plants are, are uptaking it and preventing erosion. And then here is the, the naturalized detention basin. So I was talking about this earlier. This is very similar to, 
to a rain garden just at a much larger scale. So if you if you have a very large scale operation, um, this is something that you may need to to consider for for managing stormwater uh, in a very you know in a very large um, environment. So now that we've spent some time on stormwater and how to how to manage stormwater on on an agricultural operation, we need to think about uh, the climate risks that we have coming up as well as how we can mitigate them. So unfortunately, with our changing climate, we have warmer temperatures, which means there's more moisture in the atmosphere, which is leading to more extreme weather events and unfortunately unstable weather patterns. And as you may have noticed, we have delayed and or short, shortened seasons. Uh, certainly um, the, the climate zones are changing a bit. The, um, the USDA plant hardiness zones are changing a little bit. And so we need to, to adapt to all of these, all of these changes and figure out how to, how to address them and how to be as adaptable as possible. So let's just look at water real quick. I know you're probably sick of talking about water, um, but one thing that, that you can do for sure is to make sure that your, your irrigation doesn't become stormwater runoff. So make sure that your, your fields and your areas are uncompacted. Make sure that you are only watering when you need to. Make sure that you are not watering impervious surfaces. Uh, we want to avoid irrigation that produces a fine mist, uh, just because that is basically just throwing water back up into the atmosphere, especially during windy weather. You want to make sure that you water deeply and less frequently uh, so that your, your plants and your crops are producing um, deeper roots and they are more adaptable and more resilient to, to drought conditions. Uh, there are lots of irrigation technologies on the market that are um, weather-based and so they are smart systems, they have rain sensors, they can be programmed um, to only irrigate when the, um, when the soil reaches a certain um, water content. There's all kinds of things on the market, so consider those for sure, rather than just a regular programming um, irrigation system. Oops, I lost my arrow. There we go. Uh, so another thing that you can do to reduce runoff and to be more adaptable is to improve the soil health. So certainly consider planting cover crops. Um, they will increase soil fertility and organic matter. Uh, these types of crops will also prevent erosion and compaction. They will maintain the soil structure. I'm sure Dr. Heckman will be talking about this uh, later in his talk. And then uh, these types of crops can also improve infiltration and water holding capacity, which again will lead to, to more resilient crops and to, to a healthier soil that will uh, do better with all of these changing climate conditions. So some other things that you can do to reduce, reduce climate risks are to diversify. Uh, so you want to avoid monoculture plantings. You want to have crops that are adaptable to a variety of conditions. We want to have crops that are resistant to new diseases and pests. And then you really want to consider having different types of products on your farm so that you are not just relying on any one single uh, major crop to bring in all of the income for your for your operation. And so there are all kinds of things to consider. There may be um, places on your property that are more suitable for, for certain things than others. Uh, you can consider the, the controlled environment like AJ was talking about earlier. Uh, there are all kinds of things um, on the market and all kinds of things to, to think about. So think about things that maybe never crossed your mind before, like beekeeping. Uh, there are niche uh, markets out there, certainly lots of, um, lots of things that are relatively small, but they can really add to your, to your income, um, especially if, 
if there is a significant weather event, uh, you don't want to lose all of your crop in any single um, problem. So, so really, really think about being as diverse as possible and not just relying on one, one type of, of produce to bring in all of your income. Uh, so in terms of dealing with unexpected climate risks, there are some things that can be done with regard to, to your planting plan. And so make sure that it is adaptable. So you may need to, to change your crop timing. So when you're planting, if you want to plant early, like it seems like we may have an early spring this year, um, make sure that you are ready to protect from, from a late frost that may crop up. Um, or you may want to plant later after the last frost, depending on what kind of winter we're having. And then you may want to also consider staggering planting so that no matter what happens, some of your crop will, will survive. So you can plant some things very early, plant some things regular time, plant some things later, just so that you, you ensure that you have something um, to, to go on if we have a um, unexpected climate problem. Uh, you may need to change your plant selection. So you want to look at plants and seeds and crops that are resistant to pests and diseases. You may want to consider drought and and or wet tolerant species. Some years we have droughts, some years we have flooding. Um, so, so definitely consider those. And then maybe change plant locations. You may need to, to move to a more shady area because you're getting too much sun. You may need to move to, to better drainage. You may need to install wind breaks. Um, so these are some things that you can do to be more adaptable. And then there are some larger investment items that you could consider. So you may need to buy or lease new land. Um, you just may need more room. You, need, may, you may need to spread out. You may need to, to really think about how to use the land that you have. You may need to purchase crop insurance uh, depending on, on how our, our climate is going. Uh, and you may consider renewable energy. So an investment in solar, an investment in agrivoltaics. Um, and so in summary, stormwater presents risk to agricultural operations. Climate is changing and risks are unpredictable and you need to focus on adaptability. And here are some things you can do. And here is my info. Well, thank you, Amy, for giving us a wonderful presentation this evening. I have lots of questions in the chat. So let me look at a couple of them. So Madeline reminds us that we have um, information on the greenhouse infrastructures in our module um, that's related to both of our talks. And we will also um, provide you the link to the rain barrel NRCS as well as uh, Rutgers Cooperative Extension fact sheets. So there's several of those. There's been several projects around the year. Meg's asking, is there a recommendation for planting native plants to help buffer your property from a major road? Um, there would be, uh, Meg, I can help you with that or Amy can help you with that. There are certain um, windbreak plants that are more salt tolerant. You'll see them around um, some of the farm buffers and anything that looks like it's been there for 10 years is pretty tolerant to um, what we have coming off the road in the runoff water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think um, contacting NRCS uh, would also be a good idea. They might even come out and be able to help you uh, develop a plan for that. And if um, anyone's interested in uh, like rain gardens on the Rutgers Water Resources website, water.rutgers.edu, if you click on the link for rain gardens, um, you'll be able to access the New Jersey Native Plant Society um, book on building a rain garden, which has some excellent plant lists in it. Thank you, Madeline. Catherine asked if there are any contamination concerns with collecting rainwater. Um, and 
the concerns there, for example, I have rainwater collection at my farm coming off my metal roofs. Um, so over time, we're getting some of the um, the paint and some of the zinc and some of the aluminum shedding off. But we're also collecting any um, tree leaves in that uh, deposition in the rain gutter. So, so we look at our, our um, rainwater collection as um, what's its intended use and do we need to add a, a sand filter or some other filtration um, system along the way to reduce contamination um, because it, it may very well contain spores, uh, whether bacteria or mold, that would be um, an issue for sensitive crops. And um, I think that's the last question. Uh, does anyone have any other questions for Amy that we can forward to her? All right, thank you.